Well, welcome everybody and uh, welcome to our seminar. It's a CEPR, IBF and SAFE joint seminar today on the COVID debt pandemic, historical lessons and challenges ahead. Well, there's a looming sovereign debt crisis in developing countries, emerging economies, and what are we going to do about it? Well, we've been here before, so it shouldn't be a problem, should it? Well, probably not quite that easy. Um, here to discuss what we're going to do about it, we have uh, three people today. Uh, first of all, uh, Jan-Peter Kranen from uh, SAFE, go to university. Jan, welcome, welcome back. Hi, Tim. Hi, everybody. And uh, from the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, Christoph Trebesch. Christoph, hello. Hello, everybody. And finally, uh, from the Graduate Institute of Geneva, Ugo Panitza. Ugo, hello. Hi, Tim. And I should point out everybody's CEPR affiliations. Good to have you all on board with us. Now, there's plenty of you here today, so what's going to happen? First of all, uh, I'm going to hand over to Jan in a minute, and he's going to start by introducing our seminar. He's also going to introduce our two main speakers. Uh, Christophe then is going to talk about some of the historical lessons, how we can apply them. Ugo is going to follow up by examining the particular challenge that we have at the moment. Uh, it's a webinar, so we really want you to take part, and you can do that by asking questions. Use the little QA button at the bottom. Uh, type in your question. You can do it any time. You don't have to wait until, the, uh, until after everyone's presented. In fact, it's better if you get them in early. And one of the reasons is because when you go to that QA tab, you can see other people's questions. And you can upvote any that you think are particularly good. And the ones that are upvoted the most, well, we get to them first. So uh, we will be here for uh, an hour today, provided you've got the questions for it. You always do. Your questions are always great. Uh, so I will hand over to uh, Jan to introduce the session. Jan. Tim, thank you very much for doing the introduction and for running the whole, the whole show. Uh, I'm very happy to give an introduction to a topic, um, the COVID debt pandemic, historical lessons and challenges ahead, which I think is very, very timely, of course. And I want to build in the introduction a bit of a bridge between the current issues we are facing and the, let's say, the tapping into history to find some um, examples and some parallels, uh, which we will later on hear when uh, Christoph and Ugo will, will be speaking. This is a joint event, as you said, with the Institute for Banking and Financial History at Goethe University and, and SAFE and CPR. And it's basically that small institute that has always been eagerly holding, uh, bringing together economics and, and historians and keeping that topic up when it was not so hyped as it is, of course, uh, nowadays. Um, let, let, me, let me start with this one. COVID pandemic is really a historical event and it will remain so. And we will probably read about it and talk about it for a long time to come. Why is it an historical event in my opinion? Well, first of all, it is a concurrent shock to production, consumption and income in very many countries uh, ac across the world. So GDP 2020 estimates uh, by, by the World Economic Outlook, by, by the IMF of October, very recent, is uh, about uh, the EU minus 7%, US minus 4%, India minus 10 South Africa minus 8%. It's a significant drop in GDP and 21 may be even worse in some of these uh, countries. Second, this concurrent shock has stimulated an enormous fiscal response, national response, that is said. Uh, in India, 6% of GDP, South Africa, 8, US, 14, Germany, 38. So there are also, as, quite, uh, as, as in the GDP effect, quite uh, a cross-sectional variation. And this variation, of course, is um, very likely running the risk of widening the GDP gaps or GDP growth gaps that exist between all these countries and these regions already, and which in some cases, like in Europe, have produced or been responsible for a lot of tensions among these, these countries. So we see problems arising. Uh, moreover, in the European Union, at least, there has been a surprisingly large 
common effort to complement the national program. So this EU recovery program of about 740, 50 billion, which has just been agreed upon uh, very, very recently, is in a way complementary that it narrows the gap again. So it works in the opposite direction. It delivers something like a common good to, to, uh, to, to Europe, uh, which it uh, didn't have before. And on top of that, we have the European Central Bank and other central banks in the world, which have put up a vast amount of almost unlimited liquidity uh, for the banking sector and uh, uh, has helped to maintain, so to speak, the lending, uh, the lending business. So this is the, that other facts. What's remarkable about it, first of all, we are facing a systemic shock. For a long time, since the financial crisis at least, we have been thinking about what could be the next systemic shock that we might see. But I think not many have thought about a pandemic. So here it is. Second, we have a speedy fiscal and political response and, and very sizable. Uh, and finally, we have at least partly been able to deal with the common pool or the mutualization problem that goes along with, uh, at least in, on the European side, with the recovery program. So these are all interesting and largely positive uh, aspects. There are, however, side effects which are possible and which may be accompanied by these uh, measures that I just described. First of all, we may end up with over-indebted firms. We may end up with over-indebted states. And the question of sustainability of that process arises almost naturally. This turns the light or that turns the attention to the microeconomic questions of choice of instrument. What instruments are we going to, to do to use? So we have discussed almost in this, uh, in this uh, uh, series here, whether debt or equity are the right instruments to use. But there are other questions. Should the responses be monetary or should they be fiscal? Should we forbear the loss realization at the firm level, or should we uh, restructure early on? And lastly, should we do any efforts in the banking sector on or off balance sheet? So whether or not any of these instruments is the, is the appropriate one, in the end depends on the subsequent path of the pandemic. So how does it all go on from now? Is the second wave that we currently experience here in Europe is this the last one or just one further in a, in a, in a longer list of, of such waves? We actually, if we ask our experts, we really don't know. There is real ambiguity in the world. And that is the reason why economists have started no longer to talk about expected values, about mean growth rates or, or, or growth forecasts, but rather about scenario, about scenario analysis. We distinguish different paths that were possible and then talk about instruments, appropriate policy measures along these paths, these scenarios. I think that this is a, a different from what we did earlier. And it brings really in an instrument that we are currently uh, using today that is learning from examples, from historical examples that at other places, at other times may have played a role. And I think the, 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 the impulse in economics to go for scenarios and the inv inviting of people who work on historical episodes uh, uh, in which crisis played a role uh, is very, uh, very, uh, very short way from one to the other. So in, in that respect, I'm very glad to, to have two persons whom I may introduce now, namely Christoph Trebisch, uh, from the Institute for Weltwirtschaft for uh, World Economy in Kiel, which is uh, uh, incidentally a sister institution of SAFE within the Leibniz Association, um, who has been working for a long time on debt and debt markets and uh, over our over indebtedness. And so we are very, uh, I'm very happy to, to have you here today and, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to what you have to say on our overall topic, the pandemic, uh, the debt pandemic, so to speak. And Ugo Panitza, secondly, uh, the professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute uh, Geneva, who has been working uh, for a long period on finance and development uh, 
uh, after appointments, I have to add, uh, at international uh, institutions, development institutions. So he brings two sides of experiences, academic and non-academic. And I forgot to mention that Christopher is, of course, also a professor at the University of Kiel. So that is basically the, the background. And I hand over back to Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, I, I'm very pleased to have Christoph and Ugo today uh, with us today because uh, I, I've spoken to both of them about uh, similar topics a couple of times for Vox Talks this year. And on all times, it's been terrific. So I guarantee a good experience today. To start that off, uh, I note that we have historical lessons and challenges ahead. We're leaning more towards the historical lessons side of the ledger. We have uh, Christoph. So, Christoph, it's your turn to speak. Wonderful. Let me share the screen here. Okay. Hope that works. So yes, thanks so much for the kind uh, introduction. Um, and let me start off right from what uh, Jan said and that we have much to learn from history. In fact, I think the current uh, crisis in developing country triggered by the COVID um, pandemic has to be, it has to and should be seen in a long history of uh, episodes of debt distress and debt crisis. And I think there's much to learn uh, both on how to resolve this crisis and to understand what is currently going on when looking back at these earlier episodes. Um, so let me, the, the way I framed this is basically historical uh, lessons, uh, but, but with a focus on the, on the risks, right? A bit also on the challenges ahead. So let me frame this, uh, the current challenges, the risks um, uh, in three ways. All right, three main points. Uh, the first main risk uh, I see uh, for developing countries in the current situation is that we that things may, may turn out nastier than we think at the moment. Um, as Jan has said, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, at the moment. Um, it's unclear how the second wave will play out. Um, and this situation uh, mimics, you know, the start of earlier crisis. Some, some you know, tapered out uh, without um, uh, drama, but some of these crises, notably in the 1980s and in 1930s and 20s, uh, led to basically lost decades, 10 years of stagnation uh, for um, countries uh, that had a high uh, debt burden to carry and that needed to resolve the debt crisis situation. So, let me point kind of this, this the worst case scenario um, for, the, for the developing world is that a dozen or even several dozen countries may end up in a situ similar situation. Um, the lesson from history is that case by case restructuring, case by case uh, crisis resolution can be quite messy and quite protracted. And uh, several of these crises started out similarly. The, the global shock, then there was perception this was a liquidity crisis, but it turned out that this was a fact uh, a solvency crisis, a long dragged out process. So let me give a few insights on that. The second risk that I see is creditor free riding. Over the past decades, we have seen private creditors systematically getting a better deal than other credits, and particularly official government, uh, official credits. So basically governments suffered uh, when they lent to other governments suffered a higher likelihood of default, higher arrears, so late payments and higher haircuts compared to private creditors. Uh, so private creditors have been getting a better deal. They have been treated more favorably than the official sector. And this trend, uh, this historical trend is being confirmed at the moment uh, with China playing an ambiguous role in this, in this setting. Um, and the third risk is legal. So we've seen a uh, kind of major shift in sovereign debt markets uh, over the past 20 to 30 years in that uh, the risk of creditor litigation has become real, especially the case of Argentina looms large, which had this 10 year um, dispute with creditors and ultimately had to concede and, and pay out a huge uh, settlement um, uh, payments uh, in, in 2015 and 16. Um, so this, this risk of litig these litigation threats have become a new normal. And this is one of the reasons why private creditors have gained bargaining power and it, that, that partly explain what is going on at the moment. So let me turn to risk number one. That crisis can be very protracted. And let me give you two examples of kind of the worst case scenarios. I'm not saying that, you know, we're, we're ahead of such a scenario, but there are certainly real risks uh, tail risks, at least, that we might end up in a another lost dec decade. Um, 
the liquidity conditions, the global liquidity conditions, of course, are much more favorable today than in the past. And yet um, uh, we have seen situations that, that have turned uh, out badly and I'd rather be on the cautious and, and uh, warning sign than overly optimistic uh, in this being a sovereign debt research, I guess, makes you that way. Um, so let's look at two lost decades. The first is the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, this was a debt overhang episode triggered by war lending. So this is official lending governments, especially the United States, lending to European countries in the war, uh, both during the war and for reconstruction afterwards. And countries, uh, these, these, these um, borrowing countries had piled up huge amounts of debt in the course of World War I. And these debts were basically uh, very hard to repay given the, given the post, uh, post-war situation. And the, re- the, the way the international system reacted was basically similar to today, basically cash flow relief. So there were uh, the debt payments were suspended, there were reschedulings, and it took uh, pretty much uh, one decade until the Hoover moratorium, with, which was a um, similar to the SSI, if you want, a suspension on debt payments to other governments. Okay? And that yet until three years, only three years later, with the default, de facto default of the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and other countries towards the United States, that the debt stock was effectively written off and this crisis got resolved. And this was like more than 10 years of continuing headline news. If you look at the New York Times at, 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 during this era, it's really, you know, debt problems loomed large, that there were these international meetings, uh, international uh, conferences to solve the crisis. So this, this was one example of how these things can drag out for a long time. Similar to the last decade of the 1990s, which meant more people might know well, uh, so after the lending, bank lending boom of the 1970s to developing countries, uh, there were a series of defaults in the early 80s following the, the large interest rate increase and oil shock. And um, as a, the, the way the, again, the international system reacted was, was uh, arranging case by case reschedulings, rollovers, debt payment suspension. Again, similar to today, uh, it took until 1986 to have a more um, System, systemic approach with the Baker plan, which ultimately did not succeed. So this was again, cash flow relief, no real debt stock reduction. And only with the Brady plan, there was actual debt, face value debt relief. Uh, and so it took for some of these countries until the mid 1990s uh, to uh, exit the debt crisis situation. So yet another episode of a lost decade uh, with uh, messy crisis resolution. This is a deeper dive into this lost decade. So this shows you uh, a combination of uh, information on default, which are the black, uh, the blue lines here. So these are spells in which the countries were in a default, um, and the red dots uh, combining that is our restructuring events, right? So what this uh, graph shows you is uh, in the early 1980s, many countries went into default, and then came a period of ongoing restructuring and rescheduling efforts. Right. Some countries had uh, eight restructurings in a row, serial restructurings, and to finally exit the debt crisis, uh, overhang and cure this, cure this default, um, which only happened with the, with the Brady deal effectively. So just because today we think, you know, we should be wary of, of not repeating that. That's essentially where, where I want to go. Uh, we should be wary that there is the risk that we, we, we step into this process of serial restructuring, uh, with too few, too little haircuts, just cash flow relief, and basically kick, kick down the can down the road. Okay, so there's a real risk of that. The second risk uh, I'd like to emphasize, uh, besides this lost decade danger, is free riding. Uh, this is a, a plot from a paper with uh, Matthias Schlegel and Mark Wright, where we really run comparisons: how are creditors treated um, in in buy sovereigns and default? Okay. So the, Given that there is no international solvency procedure, governments can pretty much decide ad hoc who they service uh, the first and who they default upon. And then they can also negotiate what kind of haircuts they impose on one creditor versus the other. And the paper basically concludes that the official creditors, bilateral government to government loans are junior, are treated less favorably than the private creditors. And this can be seen, this is just one, we have several ways to measure that, but this is one graph. So this is the haircut, the loss suffered by the creditors um, for official debt, right? Uh, with a median of above 60% if we use market discount rates, compared to uh, only about 40% for bank and bondholders. Okay, so private creditors uh, in that sense got a better deal. And we are seeing 
a repetition of that trend now. The DSSI is only targeted to official creditors. Private creditors were kindly asked to participate, but decided to abstain. Um, so they are not part of the current debt relief efforts. Uh, and it's likely that if, if and hopefully when we start restructuring more bonds uh, and private instruments, they will also get a more favorable uh, haircut, lower losses uh, in, in the wake of this crisis. So there's a real trend towards um, a creditor discrimination in favor of privates. And this trend might also apply to a new player, which is China. China is now the biggest uh, credit, uh, the, the biggest creditor to developing countries when it comes to bilateral official lending, so state-driven lending. Uh, in fact, this graph from a paper with Sebastian Horn, Carmen Reinhardt shows you that debt to China uh, is now exceeding the entire portfolio of all other uh, Paris Club members or all other OECD uh, governments, uh, think of it that way, and the entire portfolio of the World Bank as of 2017. Um, so China has become a major lender to developing countries, and this is just the, 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 the global plot on this, uh, showing you that some countries owe uh, more than 10% of the GDP uh, in debt to China. So China is really a, a, a central player, as many of you know, in this game, and there are signs, uh, the, role, the, the, the role of China is, is a bit ambiguous, there are positive signs, they participated in the DSSI, but there are also signs that China is trying to uh, avoid deep uh, haircuts or trying to um, uh, avoid uh, participating in the same way as other uh, bilateral governments uh, might might be willing to. But again, uh, the, the jury is still out. But there's at least signs that um, China is seeking is seeking seniority akin to the to the private creditors uh, in in the past decades. The third risk I'd like to emphasize is legal. Uh, as I said, uh, so. Bottom line, this, this, this graph is, is in work with Julian Schumacher and Henrik Anderlein, and we, what we see is that the number of cases and the amounts litigated has increased uh, substantially over the past decades. This is, of course, driven by individual large cases here. But uh, if, you, if you look at it another way, we find that about 50% of sovereign defaults are now accompanied by litigation. And, in the case, and this litigation is also becoming more disruptive, creditors becoming more aggressive. And that, of course, you know, th there's basically the, the threat that you may un end up like Argentina, okay? You don't want to see a 10-year de facto financial autarky. So these uh, specialized uh, creditors who sue sovereigns, they um, use um, a variety of tactics to essentially disrupt the international financial trade and, and, and goods trade of countries in default. That is a major risk, of course, for these countries. And that's why, you know, credit, there's basically a shift in, in, the, in bargaining power in favor of private creditors in all these negotiations. And that should be kept in mind. So uh, there was already a trend towards better treatment of the creditors. And this trend might be even reinforced post-Argentina with creditors having a, a, a important card in the hand and that is the threat of litigation. So let me conclude um, three maybe opening remarks for the discussion. Uh, history warns us that it might not be a good idea to hope for too long uh, for a good outcome and, and engage in these cash flow relief schemes again and again and push down the can down the road. So don't wait too long with deep restructurings. The risks of doing too much, right? I mean, restructuring is not a free lunch. Uh, there are costs. Country might be excluded from capital market. That might be spin um, But the risks overall, uh, viewed from a you know, global perspective, so the risk of doing too little are larger than the risk of doing too much. That might take away from you know the long run perspective. Uh, we don't. We should avoid this lost decade at all cost, and we should avoid the serial restructuring schemes we have seen in the past. Um, we should also think about ways to limit the ability of private creditors to free ride and litigate and the various options. I don't have time to go into them, but you can go into them later and then get China involved, which is, of course, a big challenge. But there, I think transparency is key. Uh, public debt should be um, a, a publicly available data. OK, so public debt should be transparent. Every citizen should know who the government owes money to at what terms under which contract. So there's no reason. Uh, to be uh, so intransparent that that, not just, that, that, just, that does not just apply to China, but to all international creditors. So I think a big transparency push is a very important element in, in, in resolving this situation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Christoph. And uh, yeah, I, I'm 
pretty sure that we'll get into how we compel private investors to get involved. I'm sure Hugo's got some um, uh, point of view about that uh, later on. Uh, Martin, I know your question. We're going to leave that because first, uh, because uh, again, I think that's going to overlap with what Hugo has to say. Well, let's find out what Hugo has to say, actually, rather than me predicting it. Um, Hugo, uh, you're on. Thank you. Uh, so that, that one way by, by Christoph was a, a wonderful uh, kind of introduction of a few things that I want to say. So let me see if I can share uh, my screen. It should be this one. You have it? We have it. Okay, fantastic. So, so I thought to call it life and death after COVID-19. And, uh, and what I was, uh, was thinking to do is to spend a few minutes um, talking about, um, you know, how was the situation before COVID, the death situation? And then how it, ch how it changed and uh, what are the perspectives uh, for the future, which will link to uh, a few of the things that uh, uh, Christoph said. Uh, so, okay. So this is the, the IMF in, in February released a report in which sort of summarized a bunch of debt sustainability analysis conducted up to November, 2019. So this was before COVID. And, and, you know, the IMF and the World Bank classify countries into green light, these are no problem country, yellow light, some problem, red light or gray, gray, or gray. these are countries which is either are, are at high risk of that distress, the red one, or already uh, in the fall, the gray country. So if you look around 2013, about uh, less than one quarter of uh, low income countries were either in the fault or at high risk of the fault. Already in 2019, we had half of the low-income countries at high risk. So this was before COVID. Then, uh, as Jan said, we had this massive uh, hit on the world economy. This is, again, something that uh, Jan said. So here on the vertical axis, you have the uh, GDP growth forecast for uh, 2020 done before COVID, done in October 2019. And this I put the June 2020, I would get similar thing if I put the October 2020. And it's just a line that says if you're on the line, uh, the forecasts are as good as the one one year before. You see they're all below the line. So massive downgrade in GDP growth. Pick one country, India. It was expected to grow at 5.6%. Now it's expected to contract by 5.5%. So 11% contraction in expected GDP. And, uh, and these are... There are only seven countries for which the fund expect to have positive growth in 2020. Uh, after the 2008 crisis, there were 79 countries with positive growth. So this is like a massive, massive shock. Um, so here it is. And if you look at forecast on the debt to GDP ratio, these are just, again, the, the orange bars. These were the forecast done in October 2019 by the IMF and the blue bars where the forecast done in October, 2020. So you see a big increase in expected debt to GDP uh, everywhere in the world. So the situation, uh, the situation got worse. This is not a big surprise, but I wanted to sort of give you a, a, a quantification of this, uh, of this feeling. And then we have this uh, dilemma, which uh, I think was put extremely well uh, by the prime minister of Ethiopia in a, in an op-ed in the New York Times, that at some point we're facing uh, this dilemma. Some countries are facing this dilemma. Uh, you know, do, do you take care uh, of your own people or you, or you pay uh, your debt? And, uh, and a way to see this, uh, there is this graph, uh, which I took from Sandra and Poole. So you have countries which are paying, you know, more than 50% of their government revenues in that service. So that tells you that this trade-off for, for these countries uh, is real. So the G20 acted on this. Uh, so one uh, big initiative, which was mentioned by Christoph, was the debt service uh, suspension initiative, which I forgot an I here. So it's TSSI, not the SSS, um, which was launched uh, well, in April. It was implemented on May 1st, 2020. Uh, originally was supposed to end in, uh, at the end of this year, but 
now it has been extended until June 2021, and the G20 said that probably uh, in April it will extend it even more. Um, so as Christoph said, the initiative said there should be that suspension uh, for uh, the service owed to uh, bilateral Paris Club creditors, uh, to all the unlisted countries who ask for it, and it is also included a, sense, a sentence saying, we call on private creditors to participate. And uh, as Christoph said, the private creditors said, no, thank you. Uh, so there was uh, uh, no participation there. Uh, another important um, uh, initiative taken by the G20 uh, was the launch of the common framework for debt restructuring. I will say something uh, more in a minute, but the idea is try to address uh, some of the problems were, were highlighted by Christoph. Uh, you know, Christoph mentioned the Paris Club. The club, Paris Club, is a club of basically uh, advanced economies which renegotiated together, renegotiated together their uh, bilateral debt. Now we have some new players. China is one of them, but it's not the only uh, new one uh, who are not part of the Paris Club. And the idea of the common framework is to create a system in which uh, all these official players uh, will grant uh, debt relief with similar conditions. Uh, hopefully, and I will say something more about this, uh, limiting this free riding problem, um, which was mentioned by, by Christoph. And as you will say there, there are different views uh, on this. So, th so that's where we stay, where we stand now. now uh, you can think that there are two views on, on what's going on, on next. And I think, uh, and I think about this view about thinking to a uh, masterpiece of French literature. One is Candide by Voltaire, who, who has this uh, figure of Dr. Pangloss, who is this very optimistic guy that says things are the best way that they possibly be. And the other one is Molière, uh, where there is this um, uh, imaginary invalid uh, which is things to have all the sort of disease in the world. So one is, is the optimistic view, the other one, the pessimistic view. So let me say something about the optimistic view, which is somehow the view, uh, I call this the view from Wall Street and 19th Street, because seem to be shared both by the finance industry and also by some of our friends at the fund and the, at the IMF, which are around uh, 19 and H Street in Washington, D.C., and, and, you know, if you talk with them, they say that the SSI was very useful. The common framework is an important advance because it will solve some of this free riding problem. And, and then markets are incredibly calm. So there was a sudden stop uh, in uh, around March, but capital flow restarted immediately. Interest rates are incredibly low. And unless something strange happens in the advanced economies, uh, you know, there will not be a generalized crisis. According to this view, there will be a few defaults down the road, but nothing disruptive, nothing comparable to the crisis of the 1980s uh, that, uh, that Christoph described. And, you know, and according to this more optimistic view, uh, we'll be able to deal with these issues with the, with the instruments we have. Uh, this graph, which I stole from our friend and co-author, is a joint co-author of both myself and Christoph, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, uh, show a little bit what has happened. So here around March, we, yeah, we had this massive increase in spread. This was a sudden stop, but they went down really fast. Uh, there, there has been up to uh, half of the year, massive amount of flows uh, to emerging market countries. There are still several countries here, countries which don't have access to the capital market. So the number of countries without access jumped at the time of the crisis, but then it went down. And then if you just want to have an example of this thing, it's Peru. Peru in one week had three presidents, so sort of competing with Argentina around 2001. And they issued a 100 years bond at a, with a coupon of 3.5%. So this is, you know, if this is not optimistic, what can you think? So the view from my window and from what Christo said might be also from his window in, uh, in Hamburg uh, is a bit more pessimistic, might be a, a bit closer to Argan, the character from, from Moliere. 
As I mentioned before, the private sector did not participate in the DSSI and relief provided by the DSSI was relatively small. Um, I have a paper with Patrick Bolton, Lee Bukait, Beatrice uh, Vedder, um, Pierre Olivier Gourinchas, and Chang Tai She, and Mitu Gulati, in which we had a proposal to, to facilitate the involvement of the private sector, but it didn't go anywhere. The, the other uh, more pessimistic view is that the common framework uh, will not uh, solve problems related to private sector participation, and also problems related, so, so Christoph has mentioned China's lending. A lot of China's lending is not lending done by Chinese government per se, but it's Chinese lending done by, you know, banks or, you know, institutions that look like private, but they're 100% state-owned. And if the private sector doesn't go in, this guy are not going to go in either. And, and the third problem is that markets are fickle. Uh, so I'm almost at the last slide. Oh, this is just to show you, this was the debt service due by middle-income uh, countries. This was the debt service due by lower middle-income countries. This was the debt service targeted by uh, the G20 initiative. So here you have uh, more than 200 billion. Here was 14 billion. Actually, not, only can, not all countries applied. So the debt service uh, relief that was delivered was about uh, 5 billion, if I re remember correctly, which is a lot of money. Uh, you know, I wish I had a fraction of that, but it's not much compared to this type uh, of values. And then favorable conditions are, uh, are fragile. This is a graph from the Financial Times that shows that things are, are good because you have a massive amount of debt, which was partly mentioned by Jan, uh, uh, issued by advanced economies, which pay uh, negative interest rates. So just today I heard that Germany is, is earning money by issuing debt at a negative interest rate. Um, and same thing for Switzerland, which has a yield curve negative rate up to 30 years. So maybe that's why uh, Peru can issue 3.5% because 3.5% uh, looks like a good deal. Uh, but I want to remind you that uh, moods change rapidly. So I mentioned that Peru issued a 100-year bond at a very low interest rate recently. Argentina did so three years ago. And, uh, and you know, and things did change uh, rapidly. Uh, so uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. So uh, have a paper with, uh, with Patrick Bolton and Mito Gulati, which put forward some suggestion how we could, we could deal if you know, bad thing happens. And just to be uh, pessimistic, let me conclude with the fact that uh, Moliere, which has also acted this, you know, in his own uh, tragedies, actually died while acting as pretending to be uh, imaginary invalid. Um, so, so, but I'll stop here. So this is some of the uh, background material. Let me stop my sharing if I can do it. Uh, uh, I don't know how to do it though. Uh, you should. Uh, there we yeah. go. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for it. Thanks very much, Hugo. That's a kind of downbeat ending about Moliere. I didn't know about that. But then again, I I, I was scram. I had to go sort of scrambling for my reference. But I say my reference books Wikipedia after you did promise Moliere this morning in this. It's not normally what we get. So very uh, terrific. Thank you very much for both of those presentations. We've got some questions in. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm hoping for some more, but I, I really want to get to the, the first question. The one that Martin asked very early on, and it really is the, the whole, the, the meat and potatoes of this whole thing, really, isn't it? And uh, so, and his question is, especially if I read it, given the, this finding on the inequality of treatment between Paris Club and private, do you view a sovereign debt restructure or a restructuring mechanism type or other legal instruments such as a UN resolution um, as desirable or realistic as a, as a way to resolve this? Uh, who wants to take it first? Ugo, do you go first and then Christoph? Actually, let Christoph go on this. I let think. Christoph he knows, go he knows first. more on this. Oh, good. So my take would probably be desirable, yes. Realistic, uh, not too much. <laughs> but um, so I think a 
full fledged SDRM is is you know hard to hard to see with the US and the UK and other. Uh, it depends. I mean, never say never, but but I guess uh, what 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 is more realistic are small steps, and and these small steps. Uh, so so there's there's. I think there are two parts to this to this to 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 my answer. The first is um, private versus official creditors. I think a, a central a central point is really to limit disruptive litigation. Right. This is uh, uh, what what seems important, and and one way to go about this is to change the domestic legislation. Right. So laws in Britain, Bra uh, Belgium, uh, New York. Uh, um, France, etc., could be changed to, uh, and there are many examples of such laws. Uh, um, for example, the UK enacted such a law in in the wake of the HIPIC initiative. Uh, so it it does work. Uh, it can be constrained to a limited set of countries. It can be time limited. And so, if there is a political will uh, to protect the um, crisis, uh, countries in a debt crisis uh, from legal. Uh, attacks from from disruptive litigation, from free riding, then there is this possibility of of changing local uh, uh, domestic laws, right? That's kind of like the case by case SDRM, if you want. Uh, and I mean, again, keep in mind that for every corporation that goes bust, they have that kind of legal protection. There is no such thing as disruptive litigation when a when a firm goes bust, and we can recreate that kind of framework uh, in a piecemeal approach. I think. UN resolution would be desirable, but again, with Russia and China uh, being veto players, it's going to be hard, and even with the US, it's unclear. Um, but that's an, an interesting model, I think. And the second part of my answer is basically, so I think with the creditor landscape becoming more complicated, um, we have to think about new, at least uh, ad hoc or, or, or uh, con conventions, right? We have to think about a new way how these, how debt crisis resolution usually should take place. So it's hard to enforce these things, but maybe uh, you, you could think about kind of a, a framework in which um, uh, there, there's kind of, there, there's a standard of principles that are applied and there have been efforts to, to go in that direction where you say um, creditors should be, should participate in equal form uh, they should uh, all bear the same haircut. Uh, but for that, of course, debt transparency is key. You want, you have to know what debt each country owes to, to each of the creditors, to China, to the privates, to, uh, and that's not given at the moment. So transparency is, is I think, the third, the third part of my answer. Um, so I think um, um, uh, we should make a bigger effort to think a big picture kind of uh, at least proposals that are, that are, for example, adopted by the GG20. Again, enforcement might not be there, but kind of a political signal that we are thinking about fair burden sharing systematically and debt crisis should ideally be approached in this way that debt, debt restructurings are happen to all creditors on equal footing um, without having a proper legal uh, mechanism. Okay, so I think there's, there's, there's small steps that could be taken now that the crisis is looming uh, it could be taken quite quickly if, if there's political will. Uh, just before we move on to Ugo, do you see much appetite for this country by country approach, for example, within Europe? I, I mean, what, one, one concern is that governments of Europe have, have so much things on their plate at the moment uh, my, that my maybe point, there's yeah. appetite, but you know, with the tension and time limited for crisis management, there's a risk that this just falls uh, off the, the agenda uh, all the time. But I think uh, it's, you know, um, the individual countries, I think the EU would be a great place to start, right? Mm -hmm. To have kind of a, EU, a, a joint EU initiatives on, on that. Um, and uh, I do see some appetite in some countries, but, you know, I, I'm, I, can't, I can't look into many others. But uh, I think there, there, there is an understanding that, the current situation is not is not acceptable. It's not 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 uh, favorable with you know basically this all this ad hoc and and, and chaos about about who's repaid and who's not. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ugo. Your opinion? I tend to agree with whatever Christoph said. Uh, maybe if I can add uh, something more. I mean, especially on the thing that uh, SDRM uh, is desirable, but you know it's not coming anytime soon. And and one thing that. Uh, Christoph said, and I uh, may add a little bit about it, that in theory, one could do a lot with local legislation, because after all, most of this debt is then litigated either in London or in New York. Uh, 
so we uh, you know changes you know in in english law and and in new york law one could do a lot and this is a little bit what we uh, discuss in this little paper with uh, with patrick bolton and mito gulati this legal air cover how one could act on domestic legislation uh, to facilitate uh, the restructuring if a disaster were to happen okay great yeah jan i didn't mean to ignore you do you do, do you want to add something to that uh, well, I, I have to put two questions in, in, in the chat, so I'm, I'm standing with everybody else in the, in the, on the question side because I'm not a speaker. So they, they... I, I, I didn't want to. I, I wanted to make sure that you didn't feel that I was passing. No, absolutely not. No, no, no. I've just put up my questions and, and see. Good, 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 good. Um, I, now, uh, also uh, getting some attention is the question from Pavel here saying, um, should a distinction be made between foreign and local currency debt? And what role does local currency debt play in the restructurings? Who would like to take that one first? Christoph, you take it first. Um, so, yes, I mean, in many of the countries we're talking about, that, that Ugo was showing of a high risk of debt distress. Those are countries that don't have developed domestic markets. Some do, but, but most do not. Uh, meaning that we are, we're still kind of in the 1980s world of, of external debt being the central part and oftentimes debt owed to governments being a central part and the IMF and the World Bank. Um, but I think globally, it's very important to keep domestic debt in, in, in mind. I think what I said about kind of this the principle, fair principles of debt restructuring that all creditors to, should take part, that also includes domestic, right? That also includes the domestic. Now that, of course, in a highly financialized economy like the Eurozone, that becomes tricky because you get the sovereign bank doom loop, right? You impose a haircut and then the banks go under and then you have to save the banks, et cetera. So, um, but, and that might even apply to Brazil, et cetera. So, so yes, we should, we have to, we have to consider the domestic debt in fact, you know, uh, Ugo has contributed to the original sin uh, literature, right, saying that the domestic debt markets are heavily underdeveloped. I think we have seen a shift in the last 10 or 20 years that in, in more countries, uh, uh, more countries now rely on domestic debt. In fact, I was expecting the next big debt crisis to be a domestic debt crisis uh, with current, you know, interest rates and liquidity conditions globally. This, this doesn't, didn't happen and we're still in this external debt world. Uh, but um, thinking about, you know, better ways of domestic restructurings and how it relates to the international way of doing this is indeed an important issue that I think is receiving too little attention. Mm. Ugo, for you. Um, so, so it's true, domestic debt has become uh, more important. And in, in case of default, one has to think uh, jointly about the two things, uh, the domestic and external uh, debt component. Uh, one thing that differentiates them is that usually uh, dollar debt is debt issued under foreign legislation. So it's usually issued either under English law, or under New York law. So whatever things will be adjudicated by a court which sits outside the country. Uh, most of domestic currency debt is debt issued under domestic legislation. So it will be a national court which will adjudicate uh, any claim to it. And so in the mechanism, and you can think that a court in Argentina uh, adjudicating on a claim on the Argentinian government uh, might have incentives which are different uh, from a New York court or a court in London. So, so that's, I guess, the, one of the key issues. And plus on domestic currency debt, you have other mechanisms to dilute it, which is through inflation and uh, which is clearly it, it's not available uh, um, for foreign currency debt. Yeah, let me maybe yes, go ahead. just follow up on that. And, uh, indeed, I mean, domestic history tells that domestic debt crises are, are often easier to, to solve due to the reasons Ugo has given. Uh, but there's, there's kind of this sweet point. At some point, if you get too much domestic debt, you get the doom loop. Uh, so you have kind of this, I do whatever I, can, I want because I have the legal power to, of parliament and they can cram into you know, the terms into my domestic banks who are under my control. But then at some point you get too much domestic debt and then it gets into this doom loop spiral. So there's kind of, I think, again, we haven't thought uh, enough about this, about this topic. Uh, um, and, and, but, but indeed, thanks so much for the pointing out this legal part, which, which, which I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> You're working as a team. Uh, uh, Sylvia's got uh, a two-part question. 
um, on this one. It's a, it's, a, it's a broad question. The consequences of high sovereign debt on future prospects for developing also advanced countries, I guess, future development growth prospects from the high sovereign debt that is going to be inevitable and the distributional implications of default as well. If you could say something about that, Ugo, do you want to go first this time? So the first part of, uh, of the question, it's, 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 it's very hard, right? So it goes, if I understand the question cor correctly, uh, on the literature uh, on uh, debt and growth, which, uh, you know, we, we know that there is this negative correlation that if you have high debt, you have lower growth, but the, the, the causality issue uh, has, never, uh, has never been uh, fully solved. And I guess the, my reading of these things that, you know, each country has its own different threshold and which that starts being bad for you. So, um, so, so, so that's a that's an amazing question for which uh, I don't have a good answer. It's it's a question for which which, which would take an entire seminar. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I probably least. wouldn't have an answer after that either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the second question is is also very good because you know when, when you think about the traditional model of sovereign debt, you say what's the distribution implication? A sovereign default redistributed resources from foreign bondholders to domestics. But then, you know, this default usually come with financial crisis. Uh, crises are regressive. And, and then, you know, so there isn't much research on this, but all what I've seen or the research I've seen is that financial crises uh, tend to increase income inequality. And if defaults are associated with a financial crisis, so then the uh, redistributional effects tend to be uh, negative. Christoph. Yeah, two pretty big questions indeed. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah. one one thing I had just you know had a had a class with my students the, the last week talking about. I mean, we're kind of with these low interest rates, negative interest rates, as as Uwe has shown, we are kind of forced to 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 think anew how we uh, how, how we digest that sustainability. Um, so we we have been used to look at debt to GDP, but if Japan with two hundred fifty percent debt to GDP pays nil zero interest payments. Right, uh, because they had 15 years of zero interest rates, uh, then of course you know that sustainability, you know, that it, it just doesn't work anymore in our old old intellectual framework, if you want. And uh, that's why sometimes you know uh, many of my colleagues jump into this likely well, what happens if interest rates go back to normal, right? Because then we kind of have, have a, an intellectual defeat with which to work. And uh, now with this very low uh, rates, um, the the the, the the key point indeed, and that's no re that, that it's not surprise that the discussion has turned away from debt to GDP to R minus G, because that is the key point of that sustainability analysis, uh, the, the key, the key uh, issue. Um, uh, and, and, and once R minus G becomes the key term, uh, then of course, growth is likely to not move as much. I mean, sure, the growth is not the exciting part, but the big question is what happens to R, right? And there, of course, we it's very hard to say, right? We are, we, we, we can't, we can't really judge upon that. Uh, but the whole discussion, that, and then at the end, uh, uh, whether whether this is too much and whether it's sustainable or not, at the end boils down to the question: What is the interest rate going to be in five or ten years, right? And that's of course, you know, the right interest rate is the one we observe at the moment. That's the most likely, you know, future rate as well. But um, uh, yeah. So and, and on inequality, uh, I mean, just, what I find appalling is that. Well, what I find impressive is Ugo showed a quote from the uh, Egyptian uh, president. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been working on these archives and, 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 you know, this kind of quotes you could see again and again and again in that crisis in the 1980s and 1990s. It's always the same distribution question. Do you spend your money on, on social services, education, health, etc., or do you repay the creditors? So distributional questions are really at the core. The problem is that the budgetary data, the fiscal data is so bad. Ugo was saying, that there is no research on this, but I think uh, you know you out there, uh, some PhD students might be listening. I think there's there's a huge uh, um, uh, possibility to dig into detailed micro data. What actually happens in these kind of default situations? What payments are cut off and what payments are continued? Uh, what are the actual transfers uh, that are happening? I think you know you, having micro data on fiscal expenditures uh, is actually stunning how little how little micro data we have on that generally on other questions as well. But I think to go to the distributional question, uh, 
uh, we would need to use all the beautiful tools that we have, but we need first the data. Uh, so I think there's also governments are also asked not just to raise data on that, but also on their revenues and, and expenditures. Uh, it's stunning how little we know about this in the detail. And if you do dig into that, you, you don't have to hand in your paper until after Christmas, I would imagine. Um, guys, uh, Julia's question. Um, do you think future debt restructurings will affect multilateral lending in the near future and the international financial architecture in general? Are we going to see decreasing multilateral lending as a result of the crisis that we know is coming? Uh, Ugo? I, I don't, well, there is a big discussion on whether uh, multilateral development banks should be bailed in. Um, actually, I was just discussing yesterday this with somebody in, in policy. Um, I don't think they should. I mean, multilateral development banks are there. They, you know, they are loyal lenders that tend to lend at a relatively low interest rates, so they don't charge a default risk. So I think they should, uh, when possible, be exempted from default. And um, in my view, they should actually step in uh, and provide lending if uh, country are actually cut out from the capital market. So um, I hope uh, there will not be a reduction in, in, in multilateral lending. Mm. Uh, you hope, but I, I, yes, but what do you think? So, so I, I mean, I don't know. This uh, maybe this is Christopher Stein. Christopher has written a paper about everything, so you might. Uh, but and I haven't seen it. One thing that I know, because I did write a paper about this, that lending by multilateral development bank is not cyclical. So it's not. So the multilateral development bank is not the typical banker of you know described by uh, what's the name of the author of Tom Sawyer. Sorry, no, I, I, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, by Mark Twain, you know, so the typical banker is there to lend an umbrella when the sun is shining and he wants it back when it starts raining. Uh, you know, private capital markets are, are a little bit, little bit like this. Uh, multilateral development banks are more stable. Uh, I've never studied what it happened uh, around time of default. Maybe Christoph did it. Mm. Christoph? So, so, yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm rather, rather optimistic that multilateral lending will will not decrease i mean maybe in you know maybe two three years but but in general i think the overall trend over the past decades and in fact the past 200 years has been more multilateral lending more official lending and one of the reasons is that this umbrella that Hugo was saying is needed right uh capital flows capital markets have become so large that uh uh, and, and, and become, uh, and they are fickle, there are these sudden stops, so ever, all these private curves pull out, and who steps in? Well, the multilaterals do. Uh, we show that indeed, uh, Bogos, mm -hmm. you should send me the link of your paper, we should cite you. Uh, I didn't know either. Um, so uh, officials step in when private creditors um, uh, try to pull out their money from these countries. Uh, so in that sense, uh, for risk sharing, they're doing a, an important job, uh, including, you know, the transfers they they, they give and uh, the world has in that sense become more cooperative. We have seen more and more uh, multilateral region. We, we, we started out with bilateral lending, which was pretty ad hoc in the 19th century. Then came you know, these, uh, the World Bank and the IMF and now there are all these regional institutions as well, the ESM, the Arab Monetary Fund here and there, all these different institutions make up now a large uh, global financial safety net. And that has been growing and it's continuing to grow. So if anything, the bailouts are only getting bigger akin to the bank, domestic banking sector to the too big to fail uh, problem. So I think we are more likely to see um, a continuation of that. The problem is that the taxpayers are paying more and more here and that the privates are getting away uh, more easily as, as a general trend as well, right? So I think um, uh, my, my, my prediction is that uh, maybe not the World Bank and the IMF, but some form of multilateral offic official lending type will definitely continue. Uh, and if you think about the rise of China and the rise of India, those are players that are much more like, those are countries much more likely to use state-directed lending, not only domestically, but also internationally. So I think this official lending is in fact on the way up. So both multilateral and official gen lending in general is, is more rather uh, on the rise and should in fact be studied more. Okay, we're more or less at the end. We don't have we don't have much time left, but uh, there is a question. Well, there's two people have asked this a, a similar sorts of question, so I just wanted to make sure that we have 
uh, that we deal with this. Um, Lorenzo was asking, um, can we discuss the the idea of conditionalities on debt service moratoria for the uh, for a green recovery? And uh, Christoph, a uh, different Christoph, has said, um, may we expect a debt to climate swaps? Uh, which uh, sounds interesting. Ugo, either of those? Um, well, they're sort of, in a sense, a, a similar question. Uh, uh, I, I think it would be uh, uh, desirable. Uh, for instance, you could think about countries uh, which, uh, I don't know, I don't know much about this, but let me give you an example. So, so the, the Amazon sits mostly in Brazil and a little bit in Colombia, uh, and I guess Venezuela, and, and the Amazon provides a global good because it cleans the air for the whole world. So you could think that uh, in a world that the Brazil, uh, and at the same time, Brazil could cut trees and sell the trees and, you know, it would damage Brazil, but it would damage also the rest of the world. So you could think that what could uh, internalize uh, this externality by uh, giving transfer to countries which uh, provide a global public good in terms of climate. I don't know how the design would work, but uh, you know, this, is, this would be based on sound economic principles. The politics would be complicated, however. Christoph, any opinion on this? Um, yeah, I agree with Hugo that this would be desirable. The, the, the question one has to ask oneself is, of course, like, is it better to give direct transfers or to make to do it via kind of a debt restructuring? Uh, I can see schemes, and I, I can definitely, you know, um, the, the problem is with 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 transfers is, is the conditionality, right? I mean, as as, as you also mentioned in the question, um, uh, so maybe you have more leverage uh, of actually seeing some some favorable change uh, with regard to the the environment and to climate. Uh, if you're in the midst of the debt, re debt restructuring process, right? So maybe there's an argument to indeed have green, compo a green component in, in restructuring operations, uh, but it's operationally not easy. And it's uh, at the end, the, the same question out there is, is uh, once the crisis is resolved, does this, has a, does, does this have any teeth? Is this actually implemented? But I could see schemes in which kind of international institutions, for example, subsidize uh, so, you know, let's have some more haircuts on private debt, but then subsidize that from the international financial institution with a green element, for example. That could be a scheme you can think about, right? Rather than let them get away, you know, without that, we can combine aims. But again, a lot of the, there's large institutional challenges, but I mean, there's smart people out there. Um, and one can, if there's political will to do this, this can be, this can be thought of, yes. And again, could be that we're, we're stuck with this kind of debt overhang for quite a while in many of these countries. So uh, I would, would rather speed up the thought, the thinking on this on this topic rather than than you know just uh, you taking this current situation as a given. We we definitely need more reforms and green the green component is is an important one. Yes, uh, we are over time, so I better stop asking the questions now. But uh, there's terrific answers there, and the clock's ticking. We got to hope for the best. There's a lot of there's a lot of word of the loss of you was the hope in the last hour. But also prepare for the worst, I guess, as well. Jan, do you want to say anything to wrap us up? Uh, well, <clears throat> the, the one thing that I would be interested in is uh, we didn't discuss much about the incentives that are triggered by suggesting a particular solution. So, for instance, if debt relief is being given early, restructuring much earlier than rather waiting for a decade that otherwise appears to be lost, what would that do to the lending in the future? You know, is, is there a, basically a reason for having this long periods of uh, waiting and cash flow reliefs only? And that also translates to the, that's both for the free riding, it's for the lost decades, it's always similar things. Um, I think that is also interesting. We know this a lot in microeconomic modeling, we always think about the what does a particular action imply for the next round of interactions. But here I'm a bit missing this in this whole discussion that we think about why is it, uh, why isn't it so maybe so straightforward to give debt relief to somebody if the response by the market is never fund that person again. We did the debt relief once looking backwards, so to speak, because the crisis has happened, 
but then the welfare effect may also be quite high. And this is the question of the counterfactual. What is the counterfactual of all these actions? And, and we don't really know that. But I think, as Christoph said, it's a great area for research. And uh, I would, could, would only partner with him saying, I hope that some graduate students are here and take part of that up. So I think I was very, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted by this theme and by the presentations. And I hope we have more of that in the future. Good. Well, uh, there's plenty that we could, if we, if we reconstituted this in a new year or in a few months' time, there's plenty for us to yeah. talk about. If you want, if guys, if you, if you want to come back, it's not up to me. It's not up to me to say that you have to, but if you wanted to, then there's a lot of questions that we still need to answer, aren't there? So, but thank you very much for uh, the presentations today, for the discussion today. Um, there are lots of, uh, we referenced quite a lot of other work and uh, also Ugo uh, referenced it specifically in his presentation. If you want to go and check that out, I, I've read some of it and it's fantastic and it and it raises as many questions as it answers because that's the nature of this um but that's all we, that really is all we have time for and it's really all we have time for more or less this year so um thank you very much to our panelists today christoph thank ugo you. thank you uh thank you to Welcome. thank you to jan and for for everyone at safe for uh, organizing this thank you for you for for turning it up uh, turning up and asking questions uh it's been a pretty awful year but it has uh, also been a year in which uh, there has been plenty of innovative and very interesting economic research and policy ideas and uh, these forums are where they really come alive. So thank you for uh, turning up to them. Let's hope that we can have uh, a better year in 2021, but with just as good seminars in it. So from me at the CEPR and from everyone else, goodbye.